Okay, hello. Uh, I'm Aaron Ramirez, the manager of Special Collections and Museum Services for the Pueblo City County Library District. And with me uh, this evening is Robin Lawrence from the Japan America Society of Southern Colorado. Hi, Robin. Hi, Aaron. How are you? I'm doing well, how about you? Not bad, thank you, thank you. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Um, we have, uh, tonight was just gonna be uh, part of uh, a series of programs connected to um, our latest exhibit uh, and uh, efforts in digitizing some really great film reels uh, created by Frank Denichi Maramoto. Uh, a uh, Japanese man who uh, lived and worked and raised his family in Pueblo um, from the 1912-1913 uh, 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 until his death in 1958. Um, and so yesterday we had our first uh, premiere of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the film reels. And then uh, through February, we're gonna have uh, some great programs, uh, virtual, uh, and uh, uh, presentations and demonstrations and things like that. So we just want to welcome you uh, as a, uh, a Southern Coloradan and um, uh, a representative of this of this organization. Could you tell us a little bit about about who you are and and your role in the in the organization? Yeah, and and first, um, I, I want to thank you, Aaron. Um, thank you for having me on. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm glad that we could support this program. Um, I, I don't know a lot about Frank Muramoto. Like, so when I learned about, you know, th this event, like I did some research and it sounds great. So I'm, I'm so glad that you are taking this on and you are taking his story. And, and I hope that a lot of your listeners, a lot of your patrons could learn a lot about this. I think it's important. So thanks so much for having me on. And I'm really excited to represent the Japan America Society of Southern Colorado. Um, so I'll just start by introducing myself and the organization. Um, like you had mentioned, my name is, is Robin Lawrence. I am the president of the organization. Um, I'm going on my eighth year as a president. Um, the Japan America Society of Southern Colorado, it was established in 1998. Uh, so we've had, you know, a decently long history of um, coming together and doing events here in Southern Colorado. Um, the majority of our members are the Colorado Springs area, but um, we certainly do have, um, you know, things going on throughout Southern Colorado. In fact, one of our board members, he lives and works in Pueblo. And um, so, you know, it, certainly Pueblo, it falls within um, the area of, of things that we do. Um, we are a volunteer only organization. Uh, we've got about 130 members. Um, of those members, a lot of them are families. So I think in total, there's probably between 250 to 300 individuals um, that are, are part of this group. Um, one thing that's really kind of cool is um, most of our members, I, I, maybe not most, but I would say a third to a half of our members are, are very long-term members. They've been around since 1998 or the early 2000s. And it, it's it's really a community. Um, a lot of a lot of these families joined, you know, when their kids were young, and now, you know, the, the kids are getting older and uh, they're going off to school. And you know, it, it's it's good to see, you know, these people, you know, throughout the years that come to our events, that participate in our events, and support our organization. And um, you know, we are a an organization, but. Um, in a lot of ways, we're, we're, we're a community of people here in Southern Colorado that uh, have known a, known each other a long time and um, really enjoy being together and advocating for you know Japan and, and, and celebrating our, pre, our appreciation of, of its culture. So um, in a nutshell, um, that's how we were formed as far as our activities and programs go. Um, you know, we have three main events throughout the year. We've got a rice pounding event uh, that's called Mochitsuki. Uh, that's in January. We have a Children's Day event uh, referred to as Kodomo no Hi. Uh, that is in May. And then uh, we have a Japanese Bazaar and Cultural Festival, which is our biggest event. That is in October. Um, but aside from that, um, you know, we've got a lot of 
social gatherings. We've got monthly cultural meetings. We've got language classes and, and cooking classes. Um, so we're very active. Um, I, I would say on top of that, we also work very closely with our sister city. Uh, Colorado Springs is sister city in, in Japan. Um, the name of it is uh, Fuji Yoshida. And uh, we host, uh, we've been hosting up until last year, I, I think for 31 years in a row, we've been hosting a, a junior high school group as part of a student exchange. So there's a lot going on. We're very active. Uh, we're not a big organization, but at the same time, it's full of a lot of members that care very much about Japan about, and very much about the local community. And um, I think we do a lot in terms of, you know, building the relationship and um, educating people in the area about some of the good things about Japan. So I'm really awesome. associated to it. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned it's a volunteer organization. Mm -hmm. um, who are, first, do I need to be Japanese to be part of your organization? Is you, that a prerequisite? No, you do not. Um, I would say, I mean, the majority of our, our members are not of Japanese heritage. Um, myself, I'm, I'm half Japanese. Um, I would say the vast majority of our members are people that have, for whatever reason, you know, they, they've experienced Japan, whether they were in the military and they were stationed there, or maybe they're a student uh, studying Japanese or you know, it may just be an interest in Japanese food or whatever, but for whatever reason um, that, you know, they have, I think we all have a, a shared interest in Japan. And uh, this society is just made up of, of people, uh, mostly non-Japanese that um, have come together and, and we celebrate and appreciate, um, you know, all things Japan. That's that's great. Uh, yeah, my wife uh, was in the Air Force and she was stationed in Okinawa. Uh, wow. Yeah, and uh, but unfortunately, she doesn't uh, she doesn't like seafood, uh, which is a I, I don't know if uh, I would just go nuts because I love the seafood. But um, but uh, but yeah, that's uh, yeah. There's a lot of events you mentioned uh, the rice pounding. That that's uh, mochi, like the uh, the dessert. Uh, correct? Yep. Yep. Um, and that's really cool. Our, actually our founding member, his name is Paul Matayama, who's, who's a giant figure in, in just Japan, America relations, even nationwide, let alone here in Southern Colorado. Um, he actually went to Japan, our, our sister city, and he got a huge mortar. Um, it's called an Usu. It's just a carved out, you know, I, I think you could call it like a tree stump. It looks like a tree stump. Um, he, he brought that from Japan as well as these giant mallets um, called kine. And every year um, at Colorado College, uh, we gather and uh, we have rice donated by a local uh, restaurant. And we, we pound the rice. Um, mochi is a, is a type of rice. It's a very sticky, glutinous rice. And um, okay. we go through the ceremony and um, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it, it really is. Unfortunately, we were unable to do it this year, but uh, hopefully maybe later in the spring or, you know, maybe next year we'll get back to doing that. Awesome. So uh, in January, do you have to uh, remove the ice accumulate uh, around the, the rice or how does that work? Are you outside? You're outdoors or? We, we are outdoors and, um, you know, amazingly, we typically do it around the third week of January and it could be done anytime. A lot of Japanese people do it um, in December, um, but it, it, is a, it is a tradition to ring in the new year and um, amazingly, it's, it's always warm. I, I think it's because of us that it's warm on that day. I mean, it seems like we get a lot of 50 degree days and we're out there in our t-shirts and we're not shoveling snow and um, it's just, it's for whatever reason, it's always a good weather day. There's always a contingent plan to bring it inside, but so far since I've been involved and it's been over 10 years, um, you know, we, we've always done it outside and uh, it's, it's, it's just a good time. Nice. And uh, uh, it doesn't get met too messy. That's I've, So I think I've seen people do this where there's multiple people with mallets, right? And everyone's taking turns pounding it. Is that, injury uh any injuries there over the years so far no um okay. so far no um so we have people that have done it over the years and they kind of run the show to ensure that you know the bystanders are are set back and nobody's swinging too much um it, it, 
you know, it's it's gone it's gone well. Like strange like strangely enough, like one of the big hazards associated with this event is um, choking. Um, it's a very sticky substance, mm. um, and you know, people in Japan, like kids and older adults, um, you know, there's cases where people have, have you know have choked on it. But um, so far, we're good. Um, none of that has really come into play, and uh, this is always a good time. Nice, very cool. So this is a uh, it's a special a special food uh, for uh, for a new year, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So I, I, you mentioned the kids choking on the mochi, uh, and uh, I've seen the uh, the Children's Day uh, events, and that's uh, that is a, a a national event in Japan, correct? Yes, it is. Uh, so we replicate that. It is on Children's Day. Like it is a national holiday in Japan. Um, so in early May, we gather and, and we've been doing it at, at Colorado College. And um, I would say we get four to 500 uh, people that, that show up. A lot of the kids are dressed up in traditional um, Japanese wear. Uh, like they, they say yukata. And um they, they get together, we have performances, we have crafts, um, and we just have, you know, we have games set up, and it's just a, a fun day for us to get together. And and, and this is one really cool thing. I, I think one really cool aspect about Japan um, is that they have a national holiday to celebrate their youth. And, and I think when you really think about that, I think that's a, a beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, I think the people of Japan, you know, that have relocated here, that have me may have experienced it abroad. You know, I think they see the value in that. And um, I think that's all the more reason to come out and partake in, in these kinds of events. So it's that that as well is always is always a fun day. Cool. And so is that a, a free event? Are people outside of the organization at any of these events, I guess, are they are uh, uh, people that are not members welcome to attend uh, to take uh, take part? Absolutely. Yes. And, and, and both is both are yes. Um, they are free events. They're open to the public. Um, there's nobody at the front door taking names and phone numbers or money or anything like that. I mean, it's just come in as, as you'd like, leave when you want. And there, you know, a lot of people just come and, and just walk around and, and just enjoy it for a little bit. And then they, they go on with their days. But um, it, it's funny how many people have been coming to these events, even non-members, uh, for so many years, um, they, they, they enjoy the events and a lot of them end up joining our organization, not so much as a purpose to be able to, you know, I, I guess gain access to the events, but um, I think they see the value in what we do and what we're sharing and they want to be part of that. I, I think it, there is a cause, um, you know, to you know, promote some of these beautiful things about Japan. And, and most of our members have certainly bought into that notion of, you know, let's support a society that is promoting Japan, something that they care about. And um, so it is interesting how, you know, we don't, we the events, they're, they're not exclusive, they're open to the public, they're free. But as a result, like, I, I think a lot of our members have come from just, gaining exposure to our to our organization through these public events great and so i, I put your uh your website uh in the chat here uh japanamerica.org is that correct that is correct thank you okay fantastic um and so uh if uh, so people this is a nonprofit organization so people are uh welcome to donate i i assume and uh, if uh, and so, what are the dues if someone wanted to join your organization? How much is the is the is the cost to to join? There, there are different tiers associated with our membership. Um, it starts at ten dollars. If you're a student, um, it's ten dollars. If you're an individual uh, joining, it'd be thirty dollars. And these are all per year. Oh, great. Um, year. Um, if you're a family, it's $50. And then you, there, there are different other levels, like you could be what's called a tomodachi, uh, which means like friendship. Um, that is $100. And then we have some corporate sponsors as well uh, that contribute. Um, so through that, like, I mean, we really like when I tell you that we're doing public events, uh, two of the three, the ones that we mentioned, the mochitsuki, the rice pounding, as well as the kodomo mahi, 
Um, you know, those are just free and open to the public, um, as well as our, our fall event, the Japanese Bazaar and Cultural Festival. But at that Japanese Bazaar and Cultural Festival, we take donated items. And um, as the name entails, um, we have a, a bazaar. So we, you know, we take these donated items and we put them on the table and um, we put a price tag on them and uh, people come and, and they buy these things, these Japanese things. And that actually serves as our biggest fundraiser of the year. And with that event alone, um, you know, that is able to sustain us financially through everything else that we do. And so when, if, uh, if people are interested in, in attending this bazaar, uh, when is it? And with COVID, is there a, a virtual option that's been, uh, that's been created here? Or? You know, we're struggling with that. I don't know how the Pueblo Library District is doing uh, with that, but we're certainly brainstorming at every meeting to find out like, what can we do? How could we do it? And uh, ultimately, and, and then unfortunately, um, starting last year, we, we were unable to do the the Children's Day or the, the um, you know, the, the bizarre and cultural event. And then we canceled our Mochitsuki as well. So. Um, right now, there is no solution. Uh, we were always hoping this would be temporary and we'd just be back to normal. But the longer this uh, draws out, I think the more pressure we have as an organization to come up with alternatives. And, you know, you mentioned that about the, um, the bizarre and cultural event. I think there are things that uh, we can do, but at the same time, I, I don't think anything could replicate you know, going and seeing a live performance or, you know, setting wares out on the table for people to look at and, and interact and, and, and buy. Like, so I, I think it would be hard, um, but at the same time, if COVID were to extend too far in the future, then I think we would just have to come up with plan Bs for these things. For sure. Yeah, I'm ready for concerts and uh, yes. being around other people for sure. So, uh and so I, I noticed on your website as uh, there are some online things, uh, specifically the uh, the language classes, the Japanese classes. At, uh, is that only available for, for members or is that open to the public? No, that is not. That, that's open to the public. Uh, we have a, a member that she teaches out of her house. I'm a, I'm a student myself and um, she's a great teacher and um, she set up this, I, I think it's like Google meeting or something and... Uh, you know, we 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 do this kind of platform where we we are engaged through video and, and speaking, and uh, I think it works well. I mean, I'm a little bit, you know, I, I'm not, I'm a little bit older, and uh, I, I think there is something lost, you know, in the context of actually sitting at a table uh, with somebody or, or you know amongst a group and, and discussing. But at the same time. I think it's going surprisingly surprisingly well. Uh, there's a lot to be gained from that. So I would encourage anybody, you know, especially those that are living in, in the Pueblo area, like if they want to learn Japanese, this would be a very easy way to do it. And this would probably be the preferred route to go, regardless of, of the current COVID situation. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think that uh, that maybe we'll, we'll post that or just encourage people to, to, to visit your website and check that out. That would be a fantastic resource. Um, yeah, so you mentioned uh, teaching. You have a, a member, uh, well, uh, that that helps with uh, Japanese lessons. Um, now, in your in our conversations, you uh, mentioned that that you taught in Japan. Uh, could you tell me a little bit? I'm, that's uh, that interests me. Uh, that was something that I wanted to do in a past life. <laughs> It was a great experience. I, I grew up I grew up here in Colorado Springs. I went to school up in Greeley and I was a business major. I didn't hear about this program until my senior year. Um, but they have what's called the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program and it's run by their Ministry of Education and it's open to all native English speakers that have a bachelor's degree. And um, you apply for the program, and if you get in, then you are assigned to an elementary or a junior high school, you know, within their public school system. Um, so I ended up applying for it my senior year. I got in, and um, I was sent to Fujiyoshida, which is our, our sister city. Um, and I taught three years as a junior high school English teacher. And um, I, I really 
loved that experience. I mean, that, I mean, that is probably the biggest reason why I'm sitting here today, you know, speaking to you is, um, you know, that really, you know, it really furthered my appreciation for Japan. And, um, you know, I, I think just from that experience, I always wanted to remain connected and um, it, it was good. And, and one interesting thing that came out of that is my wife, who is also from Colorado Springs, she ended up applying for the program and um, getting accepted. And her and I, even though we're both from Colorado Springs, we ended up meeting in Fuji Yoshida, this small town in Japan. Um, mm. So they, it was kind of a, a nice, um, I, I don't know, it was a nice um, alignment of the stars that happened for us, I guess. Yeah, what are the what are the chances? That's uh, that's incredible. Uh, yeah, and so did you? Uh, could you speak or read Japanese when you went over there? Or, I, you know, I could a little bit. My mother is Japanese. I I was raised in a multicultural household, so I I did speak some Japanese. But obviously, being here in the states, um, you know, I just didn't need it as much um, in my schooling. So, um, you know, my, my primary language has always been English. So when I went to Japan for that three year period of time, like obviously I was immersed in the culture. I, I learned a lot about Japan. Um, it's not a, a prerequisite um, for those of your listeners or, or people that are interested in, in the JET program. I would highly encourage it to anybody. And, and I would just say that, no, absolutely not. You do not have to have you know, a degree in Japanese, you don't have to have a teaching license, you don't have to have a lot of um, exposure to Japan. I, I think what really matters is whether or not you have an interest in Japan and you want to further that interest. I think this would be a great program for them. And in fact, I'm still, and this is a volunteer role as well, through the Consulate of Japan in Denver, I serve as a panel interviewer for this program. So I, I help decide like, who gets to go um, to, you know, who gets to join the JET program and go over there. So that's that's kind of a nice, um, I don't know, it's kind of a nice role for me to have um, because the, the program does mean a lot to me. And so how many uh, how many students are allowed, uh, allowed over there every year or semester or uh, cohort? Yeah, the, I mean, it, it's nationwide. So there are thousands of teachers there now. I mean, I, when I joined, this was, I, I graduated college in 1999. Um, I, I believe the number was like 7,000 at the time. And, and and that number as to how many first year teachers they're going to be for that upcoming year, it's always going to be de determined by who's leaving um, and, and how many they need to backfill those roles. Um, but I would say on any given year, there's probably anywhere between I don't know, a, a thousand to maybe up to 2000 people that go and uh, do it. And, and, and keep in mind, it's not a career thing. It's, it's a, at the time it was a three year um, maximum. Now they've extended that to five years, but I would say the average tenure of a, of a jet program participants probably two or three years. So there's always a, a churn and therefore there's always going to be a need to, you know, recruit, people with an interest in Japan to go over there and, and teach English. Fantastic. And so did, uh, d is your lodging and uh, pay taken care of, or do they take that out of your paycheck or how does that, is it, how does that work? You know, it, it depends. Um, but yes, I mean, in my case, I had a very subsidized uh, living arrangement where I was paying maybe 200 bucks a month. Um, you know, the, the pay, you know, the, the pay is, is kind of the same as, as what it was. Um, interestingly, like Japan, they're going through like deflation as opposed to, you know, what we encounter here with inflation. Like a dollar today is worth a lot more than, you know, a dollar was in 1999. But their salary, which was, which was set like back in the mid or late, late 1980s, I mean, that's pretty much stayed the same. So. Mm. Yeah, I, I think the pay is good and considering the, the cost of living, um, you know, when you consider rent, when you consider all the subsidi subsidization that's going on, like it's a very livable wage. I was able to send home money to pay off student loans and, and do all that. And we were able to travel quite a bit. So I think at face value, the pay doesn't sound that good. But when you consider the cost of living and, um, you know, and, and the salary combined, then you know, it's, it's, it's very doable. I mean, the yen is still a very strong currency and um, it's not like you're getting paid in, 
you know, no offense to any any other country, but like you're not getting paid in yuan, you're not getting paid in pesos or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it may not have as much value back home, but uh, with the yen, um, it's a very strong currency. You want to be paid in yen. That's exciting. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, and then uh, so uh, Fuji Yoshida is the town that you were teaching in, mm -hmm. uh, and so Fuji with uh, that's uh, from mount related to mount fuji is that a some sort of relation there it is very much and um i, I don't know if you've ever googled if, if you were to google I, I would even say if you were to google japan comma images and just look up images of japan i think one of these iconic um sites is a picture of mount fuji and then in front of that in the foreground there's a pagoda like a red pagoda um, that is actually located in Fuji Yoshida, that, 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 that pagoda. Um, so it is literally right at the base of Mount Fuji. Like if you were to compare that to an American city, I think it would be equivalent to like what Woodland Park is to Pikes Peak, uh, for example. And but because it's such a dramatic single stand, standing mountain, like, I mean, there is... Uh, there is such a present amount, a presence of Mount Fuji in that town. So um, every everywhere you you go, there's you know they, they really take pride in it. In fact, they have their own like religion uh, where they believe in a deity that uh, lives in Mount Fuji and, and, and she protects the town, mm. you know, from harm because you know it used to be a very active volcano and and, and they tie a lot of spirituality to the mountain it's something that we don't really have here in the states i can't really equate it to anything but um i'll just say that it's this very important aspect of their local culture interesting and so is there uh is there like climbing uh traditional coloradan activities going on at mount fuji skiing uh uh winter sports is a pretty big deal in japan right it is. It is. They hosted the Olympics in 1998. So yeah, they are a very big like winter sports um, country. Um, as far as Mount Fuji, they actually do have a small ski resort on the foothills. And then uh, they have a climbing season. The climbing season is only July and August. It's only two months out of the year. And that's the only two months where it's really safe because of how much snow Mount Fuji gets. And um, interestingly, um, Aside from Pikes Peak here in, here in Colorado, um, Mount Fuji gets the second most climbers uh, on its mountain of anywhere in the world. So that was it. That was one of the major tie-ins between Colorado Springs and, and Fuji Yoshida and becoming a sister city is because they have, you know, I guess what you could call Japan's mountain. We have here uh, with what is considered America's mountain. So um, Interesting. That, the, that was one of the things that um, developed this relationship, the sister city relationship. Very cool. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know about the climbing on Mount Fuji. That's, that's really interesting. Uh, yeah. So um, I guess we're uh, some of the things I've been doing a little reading and, and so here at the library uh, as part of the, the uh, Muramoto exhibit, we've uh, we've, Purchased a bunch of new books uh, related to uh, Japanese Americans, uh, the Japanese American experience, and so in that we had we uh, picked up Bill Hosokawa's Colorado's uh, Japanese Americans from 1886 to present, and in that um, he cites Dr. James uh, Taguchi of uh, of Colorado, uh, a physician in Colorado. Um, who who says the the question was what what is Japanese culture, and uh, he cites uh, Gambaru, not pronouncing these correctly. You'll have to forgive me. Uh, to hang tough and to persist, and uh, Isho Kenmai uh, to do one's best, and then Shinsetsu, kindness. And I was wondering if um, if if that resonated with you. Um, as a as a leader in your organization, and also as a Japanese American, in your experience, if, if those things, especially now, um, if those resonated, absolutely. And, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I, and I think you could talk to anybody that has um, had any level of exposure to Japan, and I think this would resonate with them as well. But uh, Gambaru, 
Um, that is something that is used has got a very broad meaning. Um, yeah, to do one's best, to persevere, to you know, to fight, uh, whatever it may be. But yeah, Ganbaru is, is very much a part of the Japanese spirit. Um, whether you're talking to a group of school age kids or, you know, a group of army men or, you know, a, a team of baseball players. I mean, Ganbaru is, is a very widely used word in Japan. And, um, I, you know, beyond just a word, I, I you know, I, I think it's, it's a feeling, it's, a, it's, it's just a, a way of doing something. So um, I, I think Hosakawa was, was right on with that. Um, or Dr. Taguchi, like, I, I think that's, that's great that they, they raise it. Um, Isho Kenme, um, that's another, you know, word where, you know, people work hard. They, they, they want to persevere. They've got a lot of honor. They've got a lot of pride and um, not so much just in themselves, but, you know, for whatever organization that they represent, whether it be for a library or, you know, a school or whatever it may be. Um, you also said shinsetsu. I, I think that really resonates um, with everybody um, and, and just like a general kindness and, and, and just um, a caring for others. Um, it's funny, my mom, who she's Japanese, she lives right up the street from me. But, you know, even with her, like if she's visiting my house, which she does, you know, twice a week, like she never comes empty handed, even though she's, you know, <laughs> she's my mom, like it's just part of their culture. Like she comes and she... She brings a gift, even if it's just like last night's leftover dinner or whatever it may be. Um, it's just something that really speaks to the Japanese way of life, uh, the Japanese character of, of caring for others. And, and I think it's a, a beautiful thing. And um, unfortunately, kind of like what you alluded to, you know, I, I think that's missing today in, in some aspects of our, our society. Not that you know, Americans are, are mean or, or whatever, but I, I don't think we have a common, mutually held um, character of, of being kind to one another, even though we always strive for that. And I certainly don't want to characterize all Japanese people as having that because they're, they're not, you know, all nice. But at the same time, I would say it's a lot more of a prevailing cultural aspect than it is here, you know, in Colorado. Yeah, I'm sure some of the the middle school boys maybe they weren't weren't so kind to you at the beginning. No, they were not shinsetsu, not to me. Not yeah, to I, me. I uh, have experienced substitute teaching in middle school, and that's uh, I, I guess that's a universal, right? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I agree with that. Well, um, so we're coming up at the end of our time, it seems. Um, so uh, I'd just like to thank you. Uh, for joining us, Robin, and uh, and providing uh, just an insight into your organization and your culture, uh, uh, um, and uh, you know, I just appreciate you kind of spending the time. And uh, if um, if anyone is interested in your uh, events and your programs um, and your organization, again, it's uh, JapanAmerica.org, uh, J Japan America Society of Southern Colorado. And um, uh, I really appreciate it. And um, uh, it's great to talk to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Aaron. Good luck with this exhibit. It sounds like a, a great you know, piece of work that you're doing. And, and, and I, I really applaud you for taking this up. And um, as, as far as I go, like I, I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy to represent this organization. And um, if at any time we could support you in the future, uh, please let us know. And um, to the listeners or patrons or anybody out there, um, you know, please do join our events. Um, you, you are more than welcome to come and visit um, and, and just see what we're all about. I, I think through that experience, um, I, I think you will find everything that I said uh, during this broadcast um, to be true. Uh, we really do have a lot of wonderful people um, in this area and a lot of people that share a common interest and appreciation in Japan. And um, I think our, our organization, not only do we do a good job of showcasing this, but I, I think the spirit and, and the meaning behind what we put, um, put forth in terms of the education that we provide, I, I think it really is sincere. And um, I, you know, I, I, again, I can't encourage you enough to come and participate and get to know our organization. Fantastic. Well, I will be there next year for the Mochi for sure. Please do. Uh, maybe we can bring it to, to Pueblo, uh, yeah. an iteration of that. But uh, I would love that. Awesome. Well, uh, have a great night. Uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. And, uh, and we will see you 
uh, next week. Uh, we'll see you at the next uh, the next presentation, the next program. Uh, have a good night. All right. Thank you.